I want to entitle my thoughts this morning with open faith. You know, our ministry puts out a little um, newsletter entitled Open Face. And um, I think this is the first time that I've ever, in this sermon, it's the first time I've ever really focused on the, 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 the thoughts which are behind our newsletter. But I hope that today, in looking at this idea of what it means to have an open face, you will find that your hearts are warmed towards our Father, your confidence in Him grows and you are drawn closer to Him. I'd like to begin this morning by reading from Genesis chapter 3, two verses from Genesis chapter 3. And I ask you to follow with me closely because there is something I want to point out in these two verses that I don't want us to miss. Genesis chapter 3, and I want to read verses 7 and 8. It says, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, the day before, God had come visiting. And when God visited the day before, Adam and Eve were there, were there to greet him. They were, they were filled with high expectation of this daily visit. They were waiting for him as it were with open arms when he came. The following day God came visiting just in exactly the same way. And this day he could not find, him, find them. This day they were hiding. I want to ask a question that I just need somebody to say yes or no to. Did God know what they had done? God knew. God was fully aware of it. Did God change his behavior towards them because of what they had done? In exactly the same way as he had always done, God came visiting. The first lesson I want to draw from this is that our behavior does not change God's attitude towards us. The Bible says that God does not change. Do we believe that? If God's attitude towards me ever changes, then God is not unchangeable. The very nature, we say God, the theologians use a word that God is, I think, immutable, immanent. I'm not sure exactly what word, but it means unable to change. And the very fact that he's unable to change means that my behavior cannot adjust God's attitude towards me. That's the most important lesson I wanted to learn from the verses we just read. God never changed in his attitude towards them. But something happened. That day, without any coercion from God, without any signal from God, without any sign that they were to do anything different, Adam and Eve ran to hide from God. What they did had an effect. But the effect was not an effect on God. It was an effect on who? On them. Their behavior led them to become scared of God. That's, uh, that's probably the most important thing that we need to learn. God does not change. His attitude towards us does not change, never changes, cannot change. And if that could become rooted in our thinking, brothers and sisters, instantly our relationship to God could change. But like Adam and Eve, there is something deeply rooted inside of us that makes us afraid of God, distrustful of God, not because of what He thinks about us, but because of what we think about him. Adam and Eve became distrustful of God because of what they had done, not because of what God had done, not because God had changed. Now, it's interesting that when Adam and Eve brought this upon themselves, something happened, something strange happened. And we want to look at that as well. Look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. <clears throat> God says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now you can read any sentence almost and you can pick out two meanings out of it. You can see it in two ways. 
I think most people today see this as a threat. Where God is saying, if you are good, you will live. If you are bad, I will kill you. It's very important how you see the statement. Was God, as a loving father, warning his children of certain consequences that would happen if they did a certain thing? Or was he saying, my attitude to you will change and I'm going to hurt you if you disobey? Most people, even Christians who talk a lot about grace, believe that God was saying, if you do this, I'm going to become very unhappy and I'm going to kill you if, they, if, you, if you disobey. But when you understand God and as you read the Bible more carefully, you, can, you, come, you come to see it is not God who was, who, was, who was saying, I'm going to kill you. He was saying, if you disobey, circumstances are going to enter your life. I can't protect you if you don't walk as I want you to walk. Step outside of my will and you are going to bring yourself into circumstances that will bring an end to your life. And in fact, we know the only way God could help them he himself had to make the greatest sacrifice ever made in the universe to help them out of that hole that they put themselves into. So, I want you to notice that when man sinned, their environment changed. But what happened to their environment, I don't believe it was also God making that change. Death came into their experience. It wasn't God who brought it, was it? What about the decay that came upon their environment? The trees began to die. The animals began to kill each other. The atmosphere itself became tinged with disease and, 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 and unhealthiness. Was it God who brought this into the atmosphere and into their environment? No, I don't think so. That is contrary to God's nature and God's way of blessing. God wants to bless all the time. Something happened. And when I think about it, I am concluding something. And I wanted to take the thought first. And later on, I'll back up what I'm saying. Take the thought first. I'm concluding that Adam and Eve introduced disease and decay and unhealthiness to the whole environment because they stopped believing God. Notice the word I'm using. Belief. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want you to think about this. That all the blessings that exist in this planet exist because somewhere, somehow, there are people who believe in God. And if I, 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 I wanted to just think about this. Think of the places that you know where disasters hit. Or where in the past it says that God's judgment came upon people. I wanted to notice something. Like the antediluvians, for example. What was the characteristic that stood out in these people. Violence, it says, yes. And there was no, their, their thoughts were only evil continually. But basically, the element that linked them to people like Adam and Eve in the garden and to Lucifer in heaven was that they had no thought, no faith, no trust in God at all. In fact, Jesus says of Christians that you are what? Let me see if you're on my wavelength. You are the salt of the earth. And I think um, we have been told that salt is a preserving agent. And when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, I mean salt was equally used as a preservative in his time as for a flavoring, as for food seasoning. So um, when he says you are the salt of the earth, he, he meant you are the people who preserve and keep the earth. And, and as I think about it all through the Bible, God says, if I can find one man in the book of Jeremiah, I look for one man who could stand up and, and, and preserve and stop what was happening. And I found none. Christians are people who trust God or who have faith in God. Become a preserving influence because faith is the means by which we partake of God's blessings. Faith is the key to the benefits that exist in this planet. Faith is the key. So even the health of our environment, where faith begin to, begins to de degenerate. That's why I understand why disaster is heading upon this country. Upon the whole world, in fact. But when people turn to atheism, and there's no knowledge of God, and they, they, they set up an ambassador at the UN to contact UFOs, and, and they, have, they have people doing seances at the White House, and 
You cannot teach creation in the school. Evolution is bred into the minds of every child in this country. Unbelief and the, the idea that there is no God and your accidents of nature is bred into the thinking and the psyche of a nation. Faith in God is being driven out systematically. Disaster is sure to happen. Absolutely. Look at the history of the Bible. Unbelief drives away God's blessings. Somehow, you know, I said the other night, I would like to really do a, a, a study somehow, sometime to see why faith is so critical in all God's dealings with the universe. Why? And, and I've, I've had some answers since, but still I want to delve more deeply into it. But I'm beginning to understand God's way of interacting with his, his universe is faith, his intelligent universe. Faith! What happened in heaven? We say Lucifer rebelled against God. What happened before he rebelled? He stopped having faith in God. Adam and Eve simply in the Garden of Eden, before they took that, tree, that fruit, they stopped believing God. Lucifer says, God says you will die. You won't die. Eve played with the thought in her mind, is God a liar? Is he telling the truth? And before she took that fruit, she concluded, God is not to be trusted. If she believed that God told her the truth, nothing would have made her touch that fruit. Unbelief preceded the act of sin. And when she indulged in that act of unbelief, she entered Satan's domain. Because Satan's domain is a domain of unbelief. And where unbelief lives, God's blessings are banned. The kingdom of unbelief is Satan's kingdom. And in that kingdom, God's blessings are not tolerated. And the kingdom of faith is God's kingdom and where that kingdom exists. All God's blessings are available. Jesus says, anything you ask in faith, believing, you shall receive. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Amen. If it sounds like I'm exaggerating, blame Jesus. I'm just quoting his words. I'm recognizing that. Good and evil can be looked at in different ways. One of the ways that we can view it is simply from the perspective of faith and unbelief. Unbelief brings in disaster. Faith brings the blessings. And those blessings are proportionate to the faith that we have in God. What is the essence of unbelief? Go with me again to... Um, Well, before we go to Genesis five, uh, 3, verses 5 and 6 again. We're going to go to the New Testament, but just go back to this passage in Genesis 3. <coughs> See the serpent speaking. It says, For God doth know that in the day you eat there, uh, thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now I ask you a question. I want you to consider this brothers and sisters so we can understand properly what unbelief is. I wanted to get the idea behind unbelief. Did Adam and Eve know that God was the creator? Did Adam and Eve know that God could create a, a, a world with his word? Did, he know that, did they know that he could take clay and fashion it into beautiful men and women? They had no question about God's power and ability. That is not the nature of unbelief. Unbelief doesn't mean that you doubt God's power. Lucifer knew that God was creator. Lucifer knew God could do anything. Unbelief is not about doubting God's power. What did they doubt? His word. His love. His character. I want to put it in different terms. Adam and Eve doubted God's good will. God says, this is good for you. Satan says, God is tricking you. He's keeping you back from what is good for you. They came to believe that God's purpose in prohibiting the fruit was because he was trying to keep them down. He did not mean them well. God's attitude towards them was not really one of love and generosity. He was withholding what was good from them. 
This is Satan's life from the beginning. That's what Satan himself came to believe. Satan eventually came to believe it because by beholding, we are changed. And he looked at himself so much in the heavenly mirror, whatever that was. He saw only himself till he lost sight of God, till his perspective of God became so warped that he came to think, to impose on God the evil that was in his own mind. He didn't trust God anymore. He really stopped trusting God. Not because God is untrustworthy, but because he imposed his idea upon God. And this is the, the basis of unbelief. People don't trust God, not because God is not trustworthy. Not because God does not mean us well. But our ideas have been imposed upon God to such a degree that we cannot even believe when God tells us in the plainest words, this is what I want for you. This is how I am. We don't believe it. Because we have put our way of thinking upon the God that we profess to worship. I want you to notice how it is brought out in the spiral of Jesus. Matthew 25. Now, this, in this chapter, we have a parable where a man was going away, the, the ruler was going away, and he called his servants and he gave them talents. To one he gave ten, to one he gave five, and to one he gave one talent. Now, when he came back to, to, to speak with these servants, he found that the one that he gave five talents had multiplied it, and, and he had gained five more. Now, he had ten. The one that he gave... Two, yeah, I got it mixed up at the beginning. The one that he gave to now had four. Then he comes to the one who was given one talent. And in verse 24, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know you, that you're a hard man. Reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. Now this parable is intended to represent the relationship of God's professed people to God and how we relate to the benefits and the blessings that God puts in our life. But I want you to notice the, the, the problem with the un, un, unfaithful servant. This servant represents people who profess to be Christians, maybe people who are sitting here this morning. We need to look beyond the superficial, superficiality of the words and think about what Jesus is saying. The problem with this final servant is that his attitude to the master, his concept of the master, is warped. He does nothing. Like many Christians sit around and they never tell anybody about Christ. Why? Because there's no joy in their hearts. There's no freedom in their hearts. They don't want to talk about him. Why? Because really, they've heard the words that he's good. They've heard the words that he, it's beautiful to serve him. But their hearts do not respond. And your hearts dictate how you behave. The man has buried his talent in the, in the ground because in his mind he thinks, my master is not really good. He's a hard man. In Jamaica we say, he gives you a basket to carry water. He gives you a basket to carry water. That's the thinking of this man, right? He expects, he expects me to make blood out of stone. So he takes his master's goods and he buries it in the ground. This is not any deliberate thinking on the part of people. It, Jesus is not saying people sit down and consider, I will do nothing for God, because God is a hard person. He's here searching out the, 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 the desires and the intents, the way people think in their hearts, the attitudes they have towards God. God is a hard person. He makes demands upon us. And we're not qualified to fulfill these things, because God has given us nothing. So he does nothing. He ends up doing nothing for God. It's what is in the heart that produces the results. And this is the real attitude of unbelief. Unbelief is an attitude towards God that thinks that God really has not given us very much. But he demands much out of us. And I think that's exactly the point Jesus was trying to make when he, when he gave this parable. 
Now the Bible tells us clearly, I can give you several verses, we won't read them, but I'll just quote. James 1 verses 6 to 7, Matthew 17, 19 to 20 tells us clearly that receiving God's blessings is dependent upon faith. Well, I've been caught by that, and maybe most of us have. You know, I heard um, Mark Finley, I mentioned him on the first night that we were here, I think the first time I spoke. I heard Mark Finley in a message he did entitled Divine Healing. But he said, you know, people are saying that faith is the issue. But he says, you know, there was a lady who was sick. And um, she went and she asked for prayer. And after they prayed for her, she was not healed. And then they told her, it's because you don't have enough faith. And so he says, the lady says, I had one problem, I was sick. And then after now, they came and told me I didn't have enough faith. No, I had two problems. And then she said, somebody else says the reason, the reason is because there is sin in your life. And then she says, I, I ended up with three problems. I would have been better off going to the doctor. So, <clears throat> you know, he said it facetiously because he was trying to point out that the people who emphasize faith have a misplaced perspective. He said it's not faith, it's God's compassion. You know, as I said, you know, he wasn't considering that when he's saying this, he's saying God's compassion is selective. God only helps some and he ignores others. He's, he's saying something else about God when he makes God the problem instead of us the problem. But I want to look at faith. I want us to, to just take the, the right perspective of faith. Because it is true, the Bible says faith, Jesus says faith everywhere. The man who asks, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Because the man who wavers, let not that man think that he will receive anything. The word of God says this. So, so I have a right to emphasize it if the Bible says so. But then I found myself at the place where I say, okay Lord I believe. And I don't get the blessing. And I try again, I say, Lord, please, I'm trying to believe. I don't get the blessing. I say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, and I don't get the blessing. What happens next? I start thinking, why are you so hard? Why are you so hard? What are you expecting of me? I'm giving all I have. Why don't you take the little mustard seed bit that I have and answer me? Why are you so silent? What do you expect of me? And I start blaming God for not accepting my faith. And I think many people have this kind of concept of faith. So this requirement of faith really sometimes affects us negatively. And yet you can't deny that the Bible does say that faith is the key. And I want, to get, I want us to get the right perspective on it. Let's look at it from the perspective of the story of the woman in Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, because I believe that this single incident in the Bible, and it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's described in detail here, but the Bible says it happened over and over. In the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of the apostles. But I believe that this particular incident gives us the right perspective on what faith is about and how faith works. It says, um, <clears throat> Luke 8, verses 43 to 48. It says, and a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me. For I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. Now I ask the question, who healed the woman? Alright, the answer, I guess both answers are right. Christ healer. But I'm going to ask you a challenging question. A challenging question because I know that there are several possible answers. But I'm going to ask you, did Jesus consciously, voluntarily heal this woman? Not if you believe the record. If you believe what Jesus says. 
And of course, Jesus was always kind of cryptic and, and mystical in some of the things he said. So maybe you might think he only said this, but he was really teaching a lesson. But anyway, he didn't, according to the narrative, he must have been trying to teach us something. He did not turn to the woman and say, be healed. He was going about his business and the woman came, came and touched him. And he said, I discovered somebody touched me because I felt something leave my body, right? I discovered something went out of me. And when I felt it leave me, I knew somebody touched me. So he turned around and said, who touched me? Now, before he came to this place, the woman was already healed. In other words, the healing was not a voluntary act of Christ. It was that Jesus was surrounded by the blessing of God. It is that in contact with Jesus was all of God's blessing. And all that had to happen was you took it if you wanted it. But how did you get it? What is the tool by which you, you obtained these blessings? The tool that obtains God's blessings then and now and forever is a tool of faith. It's not God who is measuring your faith. It's like you plug something into the wall. All the electricity to run any device is already present in the plug, right? But if you plug a little phone in there, you'll only get enough amperage or whatever. I, I don't know much about electricity, but you'll only get enough to power the phone, right? And if you plug a little, a little drill in there, that is not very powerful. You might not be able to even, even to bore a hole in the wall. But you can plug equipment in there that can tear down this building. Same power source. It depends on what you plug in. And that plug that you put in there, I'm equating to faith. God is not the person who is measuring your faith on his little faith or meter. And saying, okay, you have this. Try again. And you go and you pump it up and you try again and stop you. And he says, not good enough. Try again. God is not the person who is holding you at bay and saying you don't have enough faith. It's just the way the universe is designed that faith is a thing that can plug into God's blessing. It's not God who is measuring your faith. But at the same time, it is only faith that can take the blessing. So your faith is critical. But when your faith is not enough, don't blame God. Don't even blame yourself. Recognize that your trust in God needs to be built up. And it's not God who is holding you out there and saying it's not good enough. It's just the way the universe is designed. Faith is the plug that plugs into those blessings. And when you plug in, Jesus says, anything is possible. Nothing shall be impossible to you. He says you can even speak to the mountain and it will move. Amen. And that's amazing. That's pretty amazing. A desperate question. I, I, I'll take it. Yes, okay. I, I'm going to repeat the questions for, for the camera. And um, the questions don't get taken on the camera. That's why we, we, we probably don't take too many. But um, the question is, doesn't this make God a kind of impersonal being like um, the blessings are around him, but he doesn't actively participate in blessing us? Well, let's read what it says in Ephesians 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to bless us, who is blessing us, or who has already blessed us. With what? How many? All, All spiritual blessings in heaven and places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing is already ours. Yes. Amen. That is good news. The fact that we don't possess them doesn't mean they haven't been given. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. And the Holy Spirit was poured out 2,000 years ago. The fact that today people are not saved does not mean that salvation doesn't fill the world. Every place, any place on this planet that you go, salvation is waiting there for you to do what? To believe it. 
to believe it and accept God's gift already given. When we accept Jesus, God does not, Jesus, Jesus does not die again. God does not produce salvation when we believe. It was done, settled, put down long ago. People are not saved because they don't believe. Not because God has not given it. The same thing applies to every blessing. In fact, there's a, a quote in the book Steps to Christ, which is in perfect agreement where Ellen White says, In the matchless gift of his Son, God has surrounded the world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air that we breathe. Amen. All who choose to partake of this life-giving atmosphere will grow up into the full measure, the full stature of men and women in Christ. Hallelujah. Now, I don't see the air that I breathe, but it's substantial, it is real, because if it is missing, I will die. If the atmosphere of grace is as real as the air that I breathe, why is it that we don't partake of it? Not because it hasn't been given, if the world is surrounded with it, and in Ephesians here it says, all spiritual blessings, the, the, the simple reason is that we have not plugged into the power source. It is as we develop a relationship with God that our faith grows. That's where the interaction comes. As we get to know God better, as we interact with Him, our faith grows stronger and stronger. We are able to trust Him more. Everybody in here believes in the power of God. What people don't believe in, in is the good will of God. I'm in a disastrous position. I need some money badly. They're going to foreclose on my house or something. And I go to God and I say, God, my Father, please provide the money for, it, for me. And after I pray, I get up. And I'm desperate just the same. There's no peace in my heart. No, no consolation. I'm just as desperate, just as hopeless. Because I don't know if he has heard. And if he has heard, I'm not sure. That he's going to help me at all. And how can, I have, how can I have the kind of confidence that I need to have? I need to know him better. That I can trust him better. The same thing applies to the healing or any benefit that we ask from God. Our question is not if God is able. Our question is always, is God willing? And from the beginning God told us, he never turned away from man. Man turned away from God. It is still true today, but I'm going to tell you what has happened. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you what has happened. Man's spiritual... <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> God has illustrated man's physical, man's spiritual situation by using a, a physical illustration that I want us to look at. Go with me to Exodus 33. <clears throat> I want to read verses 22 and 23. It's, I'm sure we all know it very well. But God is speaking to Moses. And he says, in verse 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and, thou sh and, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt not see my back parts. Thou shalt see my back parts. But my face shall not be seen. Now, this was Moses. But even Moses was, was only permitted a partial view of God. A partial and a distorted view. Now, I don't believe it's, 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 it's literally true that Moses could not have seen his face. Did Abraham see the face of Jesus? Literally. Yeah, although he took on the form of a man, right? But Jesus was there and Abraham saw his face. God could easily have veiled the, 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 the light of his face or taken on a different form and showed himself to Moses face to face, right? But he chose to manifest him such, himself in such a way that Moses could not see his face. But he turned his back and he showed his back to Moses. You wonder, what does that mean? What is that about? God says, you can't see my face, but you can see my back. What did Moses see? Why? I believe, and especially because of what I'm going to read afterwards that God is giving here a spiritual illustration that if man is to see in certain situations 
in that situation where Moses was and where the people were, if they had seen the full glory of the truth about who God is, they would not have been able to bear it. God's face represents the full glory of God's attitude and will towards us. Man could not bear it, and so God voluntarily, deliberately by choice, showed man his back. But when you see a person's back, you only get a limited view and understanding of what the person is like. In fact, you, get, you know very little about the person. You pick up the person's shape and maybe the way the person walks, but you know very little about the person. And this is what God was trying to say by this illustration. And I'll support that as we continue. You know, in the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 12, I wanted to read an interesting verse here. Something that the, 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 the King Solomon said. And um, the first time I read it, I was kind of puzzled because it just didn't seem to match up with what the Bible says about God in other places. But in Gen um, 1 Kings 8, look at what Solomon says concerning God. And there's no way you can understand what it says here unless you take into consideration what I just said. 1 King, Kings 8 and verse 12, it says, Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in thick darkness. According to the Bible in other places, where does God dwell? In light unapproachable. In fact, I can't find where Solomon is quoting from. Because there's no place I find in the Bible apart from here where it says that God dwells in darkness. Every place it says God dwells in light. Brilliant light, light that you cannot approach. But Solomon says he, dwell, he says he will dwell in thick darkness. What point is Solomon trying to make? Solomon, if you read through what he's saying, he's trying to express how God has to deal with people. In dealing with man, God has to dwell in thick darkness. But this thick darkness is only a physical expression of a spiritual reality. It was true at this time. God had to reveal himself to man in accordance with man's capacity to understand God. And if it seems sometimes in the Old Testament that God is demanding of humanity and that God is imposing his way on humanity and that God is turning away from humanity or whatever it seems, it is because God is showing his back parts to man. He's dwelling in thick darkness because people at a certain stage cannot appreciate certain things. So God has shown himself in thick darkness. He's using the physical to demonstrate the spiritual. In fact, I wanted to show you that when Moses was closely associated with God, something happened. Go to Exodus 34. I'll read from verse 29. It says, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wished not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them his in commandment, all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And till Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And again, I believe that this is teaching us a spiritual lesson. I mean, first of all, the physical. When a man spends time with God, what happens to him? God begins to rub off on him. God begins to rub off on him. God began to rub off on Moses. Even the back part of God. There was enough that rubbed off that when Moses came down, the people saw the reflected glory of God and even that reflection of the back part of God, they could not stand it. And so poor Moses, I mean, I mean, who forbade the people to look upon God? Who forbade the people to at least look upon this pale glimpse of God? Who forbade them? Their own hearts. They fled from the reflection of God's glory. How could God ever have begun to reveal himself to these people with that kind of mist 
conception of God, this distorted view of God that made them scared even of the vaguest representation of God. He had to deal with them on a level suited for their understanding. And so Moses had to cover his face with his veil. They could not even see the, the reflected glory of God. And this physical experience had a spiritual representation. You know where I'm going next, don't you? We're going to Second Corinthians 3. Now Paul is talking about the glory of the new covenant as opposed to the old. And you should read through the whole chapter. I'm sorry we don't have the time to do it today. It's going to, it will take us a couple of hours. But I just want to read from maybe about verse 12. Paul says, seeing that we have this hope, since we have this hope, we use great plainness of speech. I'm speaking plainly. I'm speaking definitely, clearly, positively. I'm not going around any corners. I'm using plainness of speech. And not like Moses. Moses could not speak to the people clearly concerning God's glory. He could not show God's glory to them clearly. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. That system which has been abolished Moses could not even represent that to the people clearly. He had to hide it from them. Paul says, I'm not speaking in any, any, any veiled way today. I'm speaking clearly. I'm not using veiled speech like Moses. I'm not hiding the glory of Christ from you. I'm giving it to you straight. That's what he's saying. And he says, But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. Now, it says their minds were blinded. And you have to think, yeah, that was the way God had to do it. Who blinded them? God had to, uh, had to do it. God had to protect them from themselves, right? So God had, had to even veil himself from Moses because even Moses could not view that glory in its fullest extent, but he did see a lot. But when Moses came down now with the reflected glory, they couldn't stand it. God had to veil it, hide it from them. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Moses had to put this veil over his face. And so it says that their minds were darkened. And of course it was darkened because they could not look at the glory. But he says in verse 16, Nevertheless, when it, when the mind shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And when the veil is taken away, what do we see? What was it that the people could not see? The glory of God. When you take away that veil, that veil of misunderstanding, then you can see the glory of God. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face. There is that phrase now. With open face means what? The veil is gone. God forbid it should remain upon the minds of anybody here. We all with open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Now we can see, not even like Moses who could only see the back part of God. When we look at Christ, we see His face. We behold the glory of God. And what is the consequence? We are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of God. Praise God. Somebody is interested in keeping that veil over our, our, our hearts and our minds, brothers and sisters. Just step down the page a little bit and look at the next chapter in verses 3 and 6. It says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to those that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, which do not do what? Which believe not. That's the issue. God has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Lest the light of the glorious good news of Christ. Who is the image of God. Should shine on them. 
the God of this world. Somebody is interested in keeping that veil upon people's hearts and minds. Somebody is interested that we shall never see the glory of God. Somebody is interested that we won't understand the kind of attitude God has towards us. Somebody is interested that we should keep on being afraid of God. That we should keep on running when the glory of God begins to show itself in the vaguest way. If that is the attitude, how can we ever look fully upon the face of Jesus? Yet that face of Jesus was unveiled to us in the New Testament from here back, back in the days of Paul. Amen. We ought to now have confidence in the goodwill of God. You want to know what God is like? I've heard some people say it when preaching a different kind of message which I don't fully agree with, but I agree with some of the sentiments of those who say God does not kill. I don't agree with the message. But when they say look at Jesus, when they say focus on the goodwill of God, I agree 100%. I just believe that in the Old Testament when God had to show his back parts, he had to do things that were not what was in his heart because of who he was dealing with. I mean, I don't want to get into that. So let me just say that in passing. But I believe, I believe, as we look at Jesus, we see what God's attitude towards us is. Whoever came to Jesus, let me ask you the question. Whoever came to Jesus for help, any kind of help, spiritual, physical, healing. Whoever came to Jesus for help and ever went away without it. Name me one person. Amen. Anytime somebody came and said, if you are willing, you can. His answer immediately was, I will. Is that the glory that we can see in the face of Jesus Christ? Or is it that people are still viewing his back part? Like the man who says he's a hard taskmaster and won't believe that he means us well. We believe his power. Don't believe you have faith if you believe in the power of God. Don't believe if you have faith. Satan has the same kind of faith. Right. True faith is believing in God's good will. That is the key to the restoration of this universe. Believing in God's good will. When Jesus came, what did the angels sing? Glory to God in the highest. And what? And on earth what? Peace. Good will towards men. And still many have not understood. I want to read a couple of other verses and then I'm going to stop. I want you to notice how distrust can humbug us badly. Don't blame God. Recognize our condition and seek to remedy it. Judges 1. Look at this very interesting verse in verse 19. Very interesting verse. It says, And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain. But he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. Strange verse, isn't it? Who was with Judah? And like I say, man, now you know how to defeat God. Get chariots of iron. <laughs> Just consider what was the problem. Was it God that was the problem? No. What was the problem? The Their faith could not climb the hurdle when they saw the chariots of iron. When they saw the inhabitants of, uh, of the mountain, they said, we can deal with this. God will help us to deal with this. And they dealt with it. And when they came to the valley, they saw chariots of iron. And they said, even God. This is too much for even God. Unbelief can cripple. And faith can do anything. Amen. It's a question not of God's goodwill. It's a question of what we plug into the world. And I'm saying this. You know there's a fear that many people have. That when you emphasize faith too much. You're going to take works away. And people are going to live any way they want. Anybody who believes in God and lives any way he wants has a spirit of Satan. Amen. You're not going to save that person by getting him to do differently. He has a spirit of Satan. Faith. It is impossible to have faith that does not work. Amen. James says faith without works is dead. James is being facetious. James is being tongue in cheek. Faith that does not work is not faith. Amen. There's no such thing as faith that doesn't work. 
James is using, is speaking about the imposter, and he's speaking a little, he's being cute, and he says, faith without works is dead, but such a thing does not exist. It's impossible that faith does not transform and change, because faith is absolute confidence in God. Amen. Nobody can believe in God. You believe in God? If God, if you believe God is in this room, everybody instantly changes your posture, if your mind focuses on it. Instantly. You believe God is with you all the time? Man, how can you not want to grab people on the, uh, on the street and shake it into them if it really hits your mind the way it should? Yeah. And even when you, when you just have a little bit of a faith, you still want to do it. Yeah. Far more when you believe it with all your heart, it's impossible to be the same. Yeah. Faith does not need to be told to work. Don't worry that if we emphasize faith too much, nobody's going to do anything. That's an impossibility. In fact, the very reason why Nobody does anything is because we don't emphasize faith enough. Yeah. Paul says, do we then make void the law through faith? No. What do we do? We establish the law in the only way the law can ever possibly be established. By people who believe with all their hearts and therefore live the law in its fullness in their lives. Not because they are trying to live the law, but because they believe. One other verse. One other passage. Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> now, you know the story. And again, I'm just going to read two verses, so let just, let's just rehearse the story. The boy came to his father and he said, Father, give him my portion of the goods that are mine. I want to go out and see the world. The father gave him with tears in his eyes and he went out there. Spent off his money, riotous living, women, uh, gambling, liquor, till he was stone broke. Beginning to starve, he went and hired himself out to a pig farmer. And the pay was so little, and he was in such destitute conditions, he had to help out his diet with the hog food. Really, really low circumstances. One day he comes to his, himself, one day he gets a thought and he says, I'm going back to my father. Now he knows that he walked out of the home. He knows he already got what belongs to him. He knows that there's nothing else that belongs to him. He knows that his father is sitting there with stern face saying, what are you doing back here? He knows all of these things in his mind. So he picks up himself and he, 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 he's rehearsing his speech as he's going home. What he's going to tell his father about his misdemeanor, he's not going to deny it because the evidence is there, but he's going to ask his father to just have a little favor, just give him a little favor, just hire him as a servant. Man's perspective. The unbeliever's perspective. This parable is about God and who? God and man and specifically God and the sinner. That's the whole point of the, the parable. While this man is here beating himself and thinking about how his father thinks about him. Where is the father? Every day as the sun rises he gets on his veranda and he takes out his binoculars. And he's watching the road. And what is he looking for? He's not looking for a returning servant. He's not looking for a scoundrel and a vagabond. He's looking for his son. Because the fact that you spend your father's money, and the fact that you feed hogs, and the fact that you chase women and, 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 and imbibe liquor till you, you don't have any more sense, never changes who you are. God is trying to, God is trying, never changes the father's attitude to you or who, how the father looks at you, I should say. It changes you, but it doesn't change, change the father's attitude towards you. And Jesus is trying to give us a lesson to make us have confidence in God. So as soon as the son turns the final corner to home, somebody, some little figure comes flying off the veranda and comes tearing down the road and as soon as he can make out who it is he recognizes it's the father the father is not waiting for him to reach through, to come through the gates he runs to meet his son and the boy opens his mouth and his poor blind unbelief he's looking at his father's back parts, right? but he's going to get a glimpse of the father's face he says, father, I have sinned against and he begins his speech and the father doesn't listen his ears are deaf because all he can see is my son was dead and he's alive. He puts the best robe on him. 
He puts his ring upon his finger. He calls the servant and says, Make a celebration. My son was dead and is alive. That is God's attitude towards us. We need to believe, brothers and sisters. God's God's attitude towards us is always one of good will. If you can think of something good, it's in God's mind for you. And if you want it, and it's in his mind, all that remains is the plug into the wall. Now if you think that this makes gives you a double problem, because now you're thinking, well, what if I don't have enough faith? If I recognize that I'm not living as I should as a Christian, does it make me discouraged or does it make me seek the Lord more? I mean, if it makes me, if I'm the kind of person who, because I'm not yet what I should be, I'm going to give up Christianity, I'm a fool. All of us should give it up then because none of us is what we should be. To say my faith is not where it should be is simply acknowledging I don't know him well enough yet. But I have a project. I have an agenda and it is going to happen. I know the way. I'm not focusing on faith, I'm focusing on Him. And as I look upon Him, my faith will grow. You know how it works, don't you? There are some people here that I've gotten to know better since we came to this camp meeting. And as we get to know each other better, our confidence in one another grows stronger. You can't have confidence in somebody you don't know. Lack of faith is simply an expression of the truth that we don't know God the way we should. That's all it is. So now you know there's a problem. Fix the problem. Because when you take one step towards him, he will take 20 towards you. So let us, brothers and sisters, look at God in the face of Jesus Christ with open face. By his grace, let the veil be removed. Let us understand our Father's attitude towards us. And let us govern and control all our dealings with him. God help us that this might be our experience. Let us pray.